Good morning and uh, welcome. My name is Robert Dijkroff. I'm the director and Leon Levy professor here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to what I feel would be, uh, uh, would be a wonderful, uh, wonderful day uh, celebrating uh, the field of uh, computation. Uh, we were looking through the lens of computing uh, to a wider range of the sciences. And if anything, that lens is a wide angle lens. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you also here at the Institute because I think this is a topic that uh, has been here for a long time. As you know, the Institute is an independent research institution uh, that um, has really takes kind of the long view on things we kind of celebrating uh, deep problems, uh, the, the quality and intensity of individual researchers. And certainly, I th think the field of computation, of course, has developed spectacularly. You know, it's the, uh, uh, to be honest, I think if we go back uh, and somebody would, uh, through time travel, uh, be here from 50 years back, I think there are many things would, certainly walking around on the campus, it would look all quite familiar. And many things we do look familiar. But I think the way we deal with information and computing is something absolutely spectacularly different. Now. Today will be very much about the uh, present and the future, but of course we also should s s briefly mention the beginning. Um, that beginning of computing here at the Institute has been wonderfully described by George Dyson, uh, the son of Freeman Dyson, who uh, as a young boy uh, was in some sense also witness to this, playing at the scrapyards here of uh, the first computing effort. He wrote this wonderful book, Turing Cathedral, that I can really recommend. And, um, and he describes kind of the efforts of particular kind of John von Neumann here in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, this is a wonderful line where von Neumann in 1946 says, I, th <coughs> about, I think about something more important than atom bomb. I'm thinking about computers. And that's quite forward thinking. And actually, if you read the book, it's, it's truly amazing in some sense how primitive from a modern point of view the technology was. Uh, the total memory of this first computer built here was only uh, five uh, kilobytes, uh, less than now is used for an icon on your, uh, on your telephone screen. Uh, in fact, the whole memory consisted of 40 kind of secondhand uh, cathode ray tubes that uh, were used and the whole thing was built from uh, World War II scrap parts because clearly this was something that you, know, you uh, had to do on, on the small budget. Uh, it's also not true that the first computer ever was built here. It was not the second and the third, but it was the, uh, the first computer kind of built according to the modern architecture, the von Neumann archi archi architecture. And one thing was kind of amazing, if you read about these early days, is not only uh, the uh, heroic efforts in building that machine, but kind of the wide-ranging view that uh, John von Neumann and his collaborators had, uh, exploring artificial life. Uh, my favorite story is the first weather predictions that were done here in 1949, and the favorite line is that you know the first efforts to predict the weather took 48 hours. So with, with great precision, yesterday's weather was predicted. Um, um, but and in many ways that program was special too. It uh, was what we now call an example of a triple helix project. It was something that was uh, financed one third. Uh, by the U.S. government, one-third by industry, um, and one-third by philanthropy, namely by the trustees and founders of the Institute. So we had like a triple helix product before the, sec the double helix was even discovered. Um, Sixty years ago, it would have been kind of easy to organize this conference. We just asked for Neumann to speak on all of this. Uh, now we are further advanced, so now we need five, uh, I would say, equally remarkable people here, uh, four very distinguished speakers that I want to thank already uh, at this moment for, for coming here on a Saturday and, and taking this kind of uh, up this rather daunting task of uh, describing the impact of computation on these large fields, academic fields. And the fifth magical ingredient is the organizer, which is our own Avi Wiktorsen who is truly a magnet, uh, both for the young researchers here and for the very distinguished speakers, which I think they all kind of said yes within 12 hours or something. It's just amazing. Avi is the Herbert, Herbert H. Maas Professor uh, in the School of Mathematics 
He uh, is a uh, very distinguished theoretical computer scientist with a wide range of interests and activities in complexity and in the inter interaction with mathematics. And so we're extremely proud to have him here. And I don't think we could have a better person to uh, organize this day, but also not a better person to uh, introduce the speakers to you. So uh, for my part, I just want to welcome you again and hope you have a terrific day. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, let me see if I can get this to, all right. So there is, uh, like Robert noted, there is an interesting um, atmospheric uh, phenomena on the screen. I think there is some, uh, I don't know <laughs> how it will evolve. It's some dynamical system, obviously. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome you all to this, uh, I think, uh, spectacular event today. Uh, I thought that uh, in the program it says that I should introduce the topic, so I thought I'll just tell you in five minutes the history of the theory of computing. This will have to be in very uh, yeah, large resolution. So, uh, and hopefully I'll steal some thunder from the talks of the speakers, or <laughs> but uh, only briefly. Uh, the first, yeah, well, so it's, the pictures are not here. Very, very interesting. So this is a picture of Turing. So the field was born in 1936. Uh, I always like to tell my students that this is a model of a PhD work. This is the, <laughs> Alan Turing was a PhD student at the time. He wrote this paper, a mathematical paper in a logic journal uh, with this daunting uh, title. Uh, and in this paper, you know, this is, uh, what did he do? So, he has a mathematical model of a computer, the Turing machine, and uh, this is a really fantastic demonstration of the power of theory because the theory of computing existed before the practice of computing. It gave birth to the, what we all know today, the computer revolution that affects, you know, basically everything we do. I'm not sure whether we are masters or slaves here, but uh, it affects our lives in a, in a way that, uh, you know, I think unprecedented. Uh, it contains uh, two other things. It uh, contains the idea that uh, natural processes should be thought of as information processes. So in other words, nature computes. And if nature computes, computers can emulate what nature does, and that became known as the Church-Turing thesis. And the last part is, uh, like my colleague uh, Christos Papa Dimitriou likes to say, computer science was born aware of its limitations. So unlike physics, which had to discover uh, the uncertainty principle, for example, in computer science we already knew from day one, from this paper, that not every problem is uh, solvable by computers. Not every computational problem. And then the field grew and uh, lots of uh, techniques and models and algorithms were developed with users everywhere in technology and science. And uh, the next event I want to tell you about is uh, uh, 35 years later with uh, Cook and Levin introducing this hypothesis that, and I see also that there is no room on this slide. Something is weird in the presentation, but we'll recover. Uh, the hypothesis that P is different than NP. Now, I'm not going to explain this problem. This is a topic for a separate lecture that I actually gave you. Uh, I want to tell you about the nature of this problem. So let me start from the second point. It's a, it's a computer science problem. It was invented by uh, people in the theory of computation. It's a question about the power and limits of efficient algorithms. What can we efficiently solve, like say, in our lifetime? So it's a computer science problem, but it's also a mathematical problem. It's a completely precise mathematical problem, you know, it's either true or false, and we hope to be able to someday prove, you know, one of the other. Uh, most people believe that it's different. We, in fact, we are tormented by this problem since 1971, and this was a major goal of the, of the field. But then it has other aspects that uh, make it sort of uh, more unique uh, among uh, 
and intellectual problems. It's also a practical problem. Uh, it's practical in the, at least in the sense that it, uh, this hypothesis underlies uh, everything that you know you guys are doing. You know, every uh, you know, all of you who are shopping online, for example. So it underline, underlies all the internet security and electronic commerce. If p was equal to n p, all of this will collapse immediately. There is no hope for anything like this if p equals n p. Um, so, you know, in some sense, you are you are betting uh, when you are thinking that what you are doing is secure, uh, that uh, P is different than NP. And finally, if you, uh, like me, take the view that uh, nature computes, uh, this uh, question about what computers can do efficiently is also a question about what nature can do efficiently. And this uh, informs you know, the construction of uh, scientific models for a variety of natural processes. Because if your model predicts that some, you know, process in nature is going to solve problems that are unsolvable by this hypothesis, then, uh, you know, either something is wrong with your model or you solve the major open problem. Uh, so, this was suggested uh, that until we actually solve this problem of P versus NP, it's better uh, be promoted to a status of a natural law in, in that, uh, you know, similar to, well, let's say, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, I think most scientists would hesitate to propose a model that, you know, violates the second law. And I think they should treat similarly the possibility that uh, their model violates the uh, P different than NP hypothesis. So, since that work, it turned out that uh, lots of other aspects of computational modeling, computational understanding, you know, figuring out limits and power of, uh, of uh, various abstract computational devices informs science in, in lots of different way, ways. And for this, ah, here are the picture. Good. Uh, so I see that the last part of the picture is not here. So the last part of the picture you'll see for yourself. It's the uh, pictures of our four speakers. And uh, we are here about 80 years after the uh, field started. Uh, we have, uh, I'm grateful to all four to agree and uh, to come here and uh, give talks about the impact of computational understanding and these interactions between the theory of computing and the uh, sum of the various sciences, it's just a sample. And uh, uh, these are Les Valiant from Harvard, uh, Tim Ruffgarden from Stanford, John Kleinberg from Cornell, and Scott Aronson from MIT. And I'll just move on to introduce the first speaker, Leslie Valiant from Harvard. Uh, I made sure that uh, the programs contain uh, not only the abstracts of the talk, but also the bios of the speakers and, uh, and uh, the website. So I don't have to, uh, to, to start and tell you a long list of honors for each one that will uh, take a lot of time. Uh, so about uh, Les Valiant, uh, all I can tell you is that he's been a leader of the field for the past 40 years. When I was a graduate student, I was inspired by his papers, and uh, you know, today I still am inspired by his more recent papers. Uh, he's been enormously influential and impacted lots of uh, areas within the theory of computing, which again I will not list, but I'll tell you about the contribution of his that's not on his uh, website. He contributed uh, two children to the field. His two sons are a uh, young theoretical computer scientist uh, doing great work. Uh, Les wrote two books, uh, one called The Circuits of the Mind, a computational view of what's going on in the brain, and one that was just published, uh, probably approximately correct, in which he explained his, uh, his uh, computational view of the evolution and uh, competition uh, and adaptation in you know, unknown environments. So, let me welcome Les Valian to give the first talk. <laughs> 